This is Tibet in the 1930s, a beautiful isolated land high up in the mountains of the Himalayas. Surrounded by the empires of Britain and China, and yet still almost completely untouched by the outside world. Tibet is now most famous for its leader, the Dalai Lama, who was forced into exile nearly 50 years ago. This treasure trove of rare color films, shot by British, Chinese and Tibetan people who lived through these times, have been preserved by the British Film Institute. These films allow us a glimpse into a world which has almost entirely disappeared, to a time before the Dalai Lama and his people lost their country. Oh, father. I didn't know my father. It's now impossible to tell the story of Tibet in Tibet because since the Chinese invasion of 1950, it's become a criminal offence to even discuss Tibetan independence in territory controlled by China. So, to tell the tale of the lost world of Tibet, I've had to come to another country. I've come to India. The Dalai Lama escaped here in 1959 and along with a Tibetan government in exile, is based here in the Cloud Gange. To understand how Tibet was lost, why the Dalai Lama must live in exile, we have to look back to a time when Tibet was a free nation. This is Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, in the early 1940s. This film is of the main shopping street, known as the Barkor. Despite being shot in the 20th century, it looks medieval. Hardly surprising, given Tibet's location, it was almost impossible to reach, so it remained frozen in time. Nan Miguel Takla lived in Tibet in the 1940s. We had the huge mountains surrounding Tibet. And then we were inside this mountain, isolated. And uh, we had the big Russia, China, Britain ar around us. And it was the policy to be kept, this country to be kept a buffer state, a sort of a zone where the big powers will not meet. And it was, we lived in, in, in the 20th century, we maybe have lived like we were in the 16th century. Tibetan society was both feudal and deeply religious. Buddhism had a profound effect in shaping its culture and traditions. Ruled by a dual system of aristocratic families and Buddhist monks, the government's main function was to maintain the religious state. Tibet's feudal structure meant that most of the population lived in poverty. Any attempts to modernize or invite foreign influence were resisted by the conservative and profoundly religious outlook. Life in Lhasa was dominated by a huge number of religious festivals, which involved most of the city's population. Sixty-eight days of the year, were taken up with festivals. Since the Chinese occupation of Tibet, all of these festivals have been banned. Even though life for exiled Tibetans has changed enormously since the Chinese invasion, Tibetan society is still deeply religious and Buddhism is central to its culture. Tibetan prayer flags still hang in holy places. Each time the wind blows, the prayers that are written on them are released into the universe. Their colors are symbolic. They represent water, fire, earth, and air. 
Buddhism arrived in Tibet in the 7th century AD, about a thousand years after it started in northern India. Focusing on spiritual development, all Buddhists believe that the road to enlightenment lies through the practice, the development of morality, meditation and wisdom. At the time these films were made, monks made up 20% of the male Tibetan population. Every Tibetan family, rich or poor, sent their youngest son to a monastery as a spiritual and religious duty. Because monks had a high social status, poor families gave up their boys in the certain knowledge they would be looked after financially for life. These boys would just have arrived at the monastery. Even though in theory they could give up being a monk if they wanted, they'd expect to stay there for the rest of their lives. The present Dalai Lama, who is the 14th, was found while he was still a small child. In a tradition that dates back to the 17th century, the Dalai Lama, or Ocean of Wisdom, is both a spiritual and secular leader of Tibet. All Buddhists believe in rebirth and reincarnation, but for Tibetan Buddhists, the man they call His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is very special indeed. Some see him as a man-god. All believe he's a reincarnation of all 13 previous Dalai Lamas, and he's a bodhisattva of compassion, an enlightened being who's chosen rebirth as a human being so he can be on this world to help others. When the 13th Dalai Lama died, his reincarnation, a three-year-old boy called Tenzin Gyatso, was found some 600 miles from the capital in Amdo, a province in the far northeast. While the Western world was at war, the family made the long journey to the capital, Lhasa. The 14th Dalai Lama arrived in October 1940. By now, he was five years old. He was accompanied by his father and mother and two elder brothers, Lobsang Samten and Gyalo Thondup. Oh, father. I didn't know my father. Father, yes. Oh, my mother. Oh, this is elder brother, whom I bully. <laughs> my mother, very, very gentle. Almost I never saw her sort of, the mental state of temper. I never saw. Very gentle. Always smile. Something very, very nice, very nice woman, a villager uneducated, at the beginning, illiterate. Later, with her own effort, she can read uh, some books. Now here, yes, my father with moustache. Uh, he very much interest keep his moustache very, how to say, very organized, organized way. Uh, no, not like that. So uh, he used, of course, our family, from time to time, eating meat uh, uh, with bone. Uh, so every time, uh, from the bone, mm, there is something, uh, what what called, Mer marrow or something. Oh. So see, he usually used to put on his moustache, then do like that. Although the young Dalai Lama was revered as the God King, he would not take up his position as head of state until he reached 18. Years of monastic study lay ahead of him. Buddhism involves training, transforming the mind, so as to have a full understanding of the true nature of existence, to gain happiness, and ultimately, to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Buddhists believe it's only possible to escape suffering, to find true happiness by giving up all worldly desires and by accepting the transitory nature of life, 
all things change, come to an end. Don't try and hang on to things. Also, one has to understand that all one's actions, one's karma, have consequences for good or for ill. If you do good things, then you get merit and I suppose hurtle towards your own enlightenment. But more to the point, do good things and the world benefits. You put positive energy out into the world. The events of Buddha's life and teachings were celebrated through ceremonies and rituals that dominated life in Tibet. The Malam Chenmo, or Great Prayer Festival, is a series of events which commemorates the day when Buddha preached the Dharma, or sacred text, for the first time. The festival starts when the monks take over the running of Lhasa from the government. The proctors of the Drepan Monastery arrive carrying heavy silver maces to demand that power is handed over to them by the Kashag or Parliament. Their attendants ceremonially throw down the whips of the city magistrates and bow to the proctors to formalize the handover. The proctors are accompanied by the Dobdobs or monastic police huge monks who carry long sticks and whips. Wearing padded robes, their job is to intimidate and control the crowd of 20,000 monks who flood the city for the festival. For the next month, the proctors are able to impose fines on the general public for having a dirty house, for using bells on a horse or mule, for women not wearing a headdress, for the wearing of foreign shoes, or any other disorderly behavior. Gifts of money and food were handed out. While the event was mostly funded by the government, there were contributions from the British and Chinese trade missions based in Lhasa. At this time, the Chinese were happy to support religious events. The Tibetan government was dominated by a group of aristocratic families. There were about 200 families who made up the civil service, and each of them had to provide a son to serve as an official. Within the aristocracy, there were 30 higher status families who had the most senior positions. Namgyal is from one of these families, the Sarongs. Oh, that's our house, <laughs> the, the house I was born in, the Sarong house. And that's my uh, aunt, Kukula, and that's my mother. They're really modeling away. It seems quite strange that they are modeling because it's never, we never even heard of this in Tibet, nor did anybody do that, you know. it's it's. It seems quite strange. I'm sure Auntie Kukula must have uh, arranged this. <laughs> and I don't know who took the picture, but it's very beautiful, very beautiful. I think they had a British governess, and so she, she must have taught my mother how to walk. <laughs> because I, do, I can't imagine my mother, you know, sort of showing her clothes. Yeah, they're wearing the Lhasa. Uh, ceremonial costumes. Kukula is considered very beautiful, and she, she's really beautiful in here, I must say. And you notice here, the, uh, oh, this is also in our garden. We had one of the best gardens also in Lhasa, because my grandfather himself, he worked in the, in the garden, and uh, also he made all the family members come and work. And we, each child, had a tree. We had to water the tree, fertilize it, and we were only allowed to take the fruits of that tree and not, not no fruits from the other tree. So we had strawberries, we had gooseberries, we had pears, everything. In this picture, you see my aunts together with my grandfather. They had the same father, Sarong, but their mother, they had three different mothers. They were three sisters from the Tsarong, original Tsarong family. This sort of family structure 
was not unusual in Tibet. Men could marry a number of women, and even women could marry a number of men. The reason is to keep the family wealth together. Married out the brothers, had several wives, they're, they're bound to be troubles, and then they might say, OK, we want to separate the land. So they usually had brothers marry one daughter or the daughters marrying several brothers, so on. It was very common. Divorce did exist, and, and usually what happened was before, during marriage, there is a contract made. And then usually most of the divorces, the wife would be well looked after when she leaves the home. And if there's a son, the son stays with the father and the daughter stays with the mother. So there's no custody of children fighting about it. Automatically, the daughter goes to the mother, the son goes to the father. They could also remarry. We had no problems about divorces or widows remarrying. In, in fact, if they were younger, they were encouraged to marry. Tibet's feudal structure meant that most of the population lived in poverty. Ordinary families were reliant on the landowners for a living. They were effectively owned by them, and each family had specific jobs they were born into. Funt Sog Sering's family were tailors for one of the aristocratic families in Lhasa. I come from a tailoring family. My father and mother were both tailors, and they trained me. Now, these are the costumes for the aristocratic ladies. In terms of design and patterns, these outfits are type worn by the aristocrats, but they're really quite similar to those that more ordinary women would wear. There was summer and winter wear, and these outfits are for the winter. These are definitely winter wear. You can tell by the length of the sleeves. When it comes to making these costumes, we did everything by hand. In those days, we didn't have sewing machines in Tibet. But for a tailor like me, it would take about two days. That's right, I could complete something like that in about two days. These are the costumes of the Kashak, and they are relatively easy to sew. All of the aristocratic costumes were made of brocade, but the type of brocade in terms of color, shine, pattern and quality would again depend on their rank. If we were making something for government civil servant, the design and pattern would depend completely on their rank and status. Shuo Lobsang Daoji was a junior rank civil servant in the early 1950s. The higher rank officials had a huge number of costumes they had to wear, while the lower ranks had far fewer. One of the original ancient costumes that was traditionally worn on official occasions is called the Galu costume. And I have worn that costume myself. I was one of the lowest ranks, like the sixth or seventh grade. And we all wore the Galu. It was the same color for everyone. But for day-to-day -day wear, I wore the native Nambu outfit, which was made of black or brown woolen cloth. A unique feature of the costume was the yellow hat called a bokto, which was worn by every grade of civil servant. As for the length of our hair, everybody just let it grow. Some had it down to their waist, some a bit shorter. You let it grow to its natural length and you never get it cut. I used to have hair down to here in those days. It was very long and very thick. The top knot or pajok were very fiddly to do. They would take ages, but once you got used to it, you could do it yourself. If you were in a hurry, you would need help, especially with the braiding, so you would teach your wife how to do it and she would help you. Later, you could call in a professional hairdresser who specialized in braiding and they were very skilled and therefore quicker. Most men and women had long hair. Of course, the monks didn't because they had to have their heads shaved. Everybody else grew their hair long.
this massive civil and monastic bureaucracy within Lhasa was about to be led spiritually, if not politically, by the five-year-old Dalai Lama. Before his official enthronement, he stayed at the summer palace, the Norbalinka. At first, his family were also allowed to stay there too, before he began his new life. Of course, at that time, my mother and the father and my other brother remain or stay with me. Then mother and the father, uh, uh, I think every day is to come to see me. And also I also is visited uh, to their home. I enjoy my native village's food. While pilgrims came from all over Tibet, foreign dignitaries also paid homage to the God King. The British political officer in nearby Sikkim brought a movie camera with him and managed to get this first ever moving picture of the Dalai Lama. Sir Basil Gould, seen here with a white prayer scarf around his neck, also brought an expensive foreign toy car for the little boy. But already his status set him apart from other children, and only his older brother, Lobsang, was allowed to test drive it. Oh, this is my brother. Elder brother. So the people felt if I handle and maybe too risk, so my elder brother let him, you see, play. Sometimes I feel a little jealousy. <laughs> Somebody's in the car. I wonder if that is my husband. It's him. <laughs> Nam Gyal married the Dalai Lama's older brother, Lobsang, in 1962. There's Lobsang on the horse now. I, I see him. Lobsang so serious. I can't believe it. He looks so serious in there. He's not a serious person, but in there he looks so serious. Now, that, that is a very nice picture, yes, of um, Lobsang's father with his mother going in front of him. One wonderful thing about my mother-in-law, which I really admire, is she loved wearing her own simple jewellery and the dresses. She was a wonderful person, very simple, uh, from, from a small village, but she was sort of always so kind to everybody. If somebody, a beggar, came to the home and asked for something, she'd ask the cook to please feed the person, whoever it was. And she was really kind to everybody. Wonderful person. The date for the 14th Dalai Lama's enthronement ceremony at the Potala Palace was reached according to complex astrological calculations. The distance between the Norbalinka Palace and the Potala is only a few miles. The Dalai Lama will be accompanied on this short journey by the whole of his monastic and civil retinue. The 13-story Potala was originally built in the seventh century. It's a quarter of a mile long with over a thousand rooms. It was the winter residence of the Dalai Lama, a center for religious worship and training, as well as housing Tibet's government and huge civil service. Tenzin Gyatso was enthroned as the 14th Dalai Lama on the 22nd of February, 1940. A life of austerity and strict scholarly pursuit began for the five-year-old and his brother Lobsang. Well, I think for him, being a normal child and then suddenly becoming a monk and then coming up to Lhasa with His Holiness and uh, leaving the parents and then suddenly going into this huge Portola Palace and living there amidst the older monks who can be quite strict, and he, and he used to often tell me it wasn't that um, pleasant there. The elder brother stay with me. We always play, uh, and sometimes I bully on him, <laughs> although he's <laughs> older than me. <laughs> he used to talk about uh, his holiness being quite naughty and mischievous. And then when he was naughty, his tutors used to uh, frighten Lobsang. And then he said, then his holiness, he used to get into a lot of uh, very nice games, running around and then feeding the birds outside on the roofs. That was the greatest fun. Here were these two little boys with the older 
uh, attendants and huge dark rooms and it was very frightening for them and I mean coming from a village where you had a lot of uh, running around freedom and then suddenly you are put there it must have been quite intimidating for him so then I think once a month my mother came so when my mother came I feel very happy then my mother uh, about the part I feel a little mm, little uncomfortable little sad <laughs> While the young boy studied, a monk regent took the role of Tibet's temporal leader until the Dalai Lama reached the age of majority. Regent Retting, seen here with his enormous bodyguard, Utukba, oversaw much of this power vacuum, but his regime was seen as corrupt. He was displaced and then imprisoned after an attempted coup. He died in jail. The Dalai Lama had to wait to take full political power. But as the country's spiritual leader, he acted as a figurehead. One of the five-year-old's official duties was attending cabinet meetings. His strict routine only varied for the important festivals. The festival of the votive offering took place in the eastern courtyard of the Potala Palace. It was a deeply significant solemn occasion in which all the sins and bad events from the previous year were purged, clearing the way for the next. The yellow-hatted monks of Dalai Lama's own Namgyal Monastery joined the government and civil officials as they prostrate themselves in front of His Holiness. Watching from the top floor is the Dalai Lama. The main event of the votive offering is the Chum, a tantric dance. Accompanied by drummers and trumpets, dancers emerge into the courtyard. They have spent many hours in meditation envisioning themselves as a deity they're about to perform. Uza Naring Tashi was one of these dancers and later taught chum dancing. Now here are the chum dancers making the entrance. I have performed this dance myself. This was performed on the last day of the Tibetan calendar year. As the New Year is approaching, it's performed as an auspicious ritual to make sure that during the following year there is enough rain when we need it, that no misfortunes happen, that we are protected from any negative forces and that there is peace in the world. That's why we perform the Cham dance. This one with the horns in the middle is the principal character of the Cham dance, the Tamjin Chukyan. Ringed around him are 22 black hat dancers and 16 mask dancers. Teaching the stag dance is very difficult, especially as they start as young boys. I found it very hard myself. Although he looked like an adult, he's actually a boy. He would probably be about 12, 13 or maybe even 14. I remember being very anxious and scared during the performance in case we made a mistake, because if you got anything wrong, discipline was very strict. Even if you made a tiny mistake, you'd be punished. Only young boys are agile enough to perform this. Your chum teachers train you, because the training involves a lot of kneeling, You'd get lots of cuts and bruises on your knees, and you'd get beatings too. Only through such strict training can you achieve perfection. When we began our training and were learning how to do the black hat dance, the repetitive arm and leg movements made you very stiff, so stiff that it would be really uncomfortable to sit cross-legged for the prayer sessions. 
The costumes were very heavy and difficult to wear. But if you didn't wear them, you'd look too puny. You wouldn't look the part, so there was packing to beef you up. You'd get very stuffy inside the mask. The performance would last three hours and the whole affair would be at least three hours. At the end of the ceremony, a cathartic fire purification rite is performed to ensure that the last trace of evil are dispelled. Now you can see they are heating up oil in a cauldron. Later they add home or alcohol. In this ritual, you fill a human skull with alcohol, and then you pour it into the boiling oil. Tibetan Buddhism differs from other types because it has its roots in the traditions of the earlier Bon religion. Therefore, there's a belief in gods and celestial beings. And also, there are various traditions that involve all Tibetan society in the practice of Buddhism. Now, Tibetans believe that their prayers can be given added power by being conducted by means of a prayer wheel. Here's a prayer wheel. Walking round the wheel means that my prayers have the power, all the written prayers, inside this wheel. Incredible. Also, there are flags and beads which have a similar thing, prayers through repetition. And the mantras are used to really gain merit and to help one on one's path to enlightenment. Prayer wheels can contain up to a mile of written prayers. They are symbolically recited with every turn. Pilgrims earn merit and concentrate their minds on the mantras they are reciting as the wheel turns. The circular five-mile walk which surrounded Lhasa was known as the Linkor. On the festival days, pilgrims would start walking early in the morning. Artemisia, scrub rhododendron and juniper twigs were burnt and the air would be filled with incense. A new Linkor has been created at McCloy Gange. It surrounds uh, Dalai Lama's own residence up there. This replaces the sacred path lost at Lhasa. Pilgrims now walk it. This is a particularly busy day, it's a festival day. These days, I say, they just walk it. In the past, pilgrims would prostrate themselves along the route. And um, that was done rather like this. One simply stops, says a prayer, and then one measures one's length on the ground, right way down to the bottom and up again. And so one goes, right, right, right around the path. I put my feet where my head was and down I go again. Difficult process, but it was to show respect and compassion for all thinking beings to uh, remove negative forces and to gain merit to help one on one's path to enlightenment. Jampa Chodan was a young nun living in Lhasa at the time. This is the lingo, the long circuit just beyond Chopur Hill. The shot is taken of the section just below Chopur Hill. There used to be people carving mantras on stones, making clay statues, and many places where you could make incense offerings. There would be many people walking the lingo. Down here, there would be people doing the half sideways prostrations as well as the forward prostrations. I didn't manage to do any sideways prostrations, but I managed to do one circuit during the forward prostrations. Here they are making the descent. Sometimes when you are prostrating here, you would nearly fall down. 
I did a lingo circuit. I took six days in morning. In the midday sun, you couldn't do the prostration, so you would have a rest. Friends would bring you a meal, so you would have a lunch break. People would normally get up early and start at dawn. Jampa Sultram and Tenzing Choni Tara also did the Lingko circuit. When they used to do the old Lingko circuit, it used to take about two hours. But during Buddhist festivals, people weren't satisfied with merely walking it. They would prostrate themselves all the way around. So, as we were talking about this yesterday, it turns out that we both happened to have done the full body length prostrations and made the full circuit. It would vary how long it would take to do the full body length prostrations, depending on the individual. The fast ones would do it in three to four days, Others might do it in short stages, so it would take about seven to eight days to do the full circuit. Wherever you ended the day, you'd leave a mark, and then you'd resume from there the next day. He said yesterday he did it in four days. The reason for doing the prostrations is to accumulate merit and to cleanse yourself of your negativities. It's an entirely spiritual activity. And now here are some pilgrims who have come from villages far away. They have come for the Malam festival. You can see that they are carrying their provisions in packs on their back. There were people coming from all different directions. Some would beg, some would offer prayers, and some would give alms to the beggars. One was free to do what one wished. You would give soup, tea, or money to unmarried. There is somebody letting out some tzampa for the beggars. On the day to celebrate the Buddha's enlightenment, the Ling Court is especially crowded. Many people are begging for alms. The giving of money, food or tea was very much part of the pilgrim's practice, and it still is today. These days in McLeod Gange, the beggars are Indians and the pilgrims giving money are Tibetan refugees. <laughs> On festival days, the cabinet and senior civil officials also walked the Ling Hall, but they would get very hot in their heavy ceremonial costumes, and so would stop off the British mission for a cup of tea. Historically, the British and Chinese were officially represented in Tibet. British pressure to allow trading had led to the establishment of a new British trade mission in 1937, and in the mid-1940s, a Chinese representative arrived in Lhasa. Relations with the British were cordial, while they were more tense with the Chinese. Dr. Sun Lien Shen, seen here being welcomed by Jigme Tering, the Tibetan finance minister, was a representative of the Chinese nationalist government. At home, China was in the midst of a bloody civil war between the nationalists and the communists. Life in Lhasa continued according to ancient custom and practice. The Dalai Lama lived in the Potala during the winter and the Norba Linka during the summer. Twice a year, the civil and religious hierarchy accompanied him on his move from palace to palace. Identified by the peacock feathered umbrella, which accompanied his sedan chair or palanquin, the whole population of Lhasa watched silently for a glimpse of his holiness. At the front of the procession, there would be the lower rank officials and they would get higher and higher the nearer they got to His Holiness's palanquin. The front column are the monk civil servants in order of importance, up to the cabinet ministers who ride alongside His Holiness. Behind the palanquin are his two personal tutors, 
and then his immediate family members. The lay civil officials bring up the rear at the end of the procession according to one's rank and position. It was the same protocol as when you would have an official audience with His Holiness. As a junior civil servant, my turn would come somewhere at the very end. I went to see the Dalai Lama many times. We would stand on both sides of the route. Because he traveled in a palanquin, you only be able to get occasional glance of him. We used to also stand in line with the crowd and view and get a blessing from His Holiness while he was in the palanquin. Was, everything was so silent, incense burning, and people very quiet and trying hard to get a glimpse of him. And at the end, they would have the army band coming, which was more fun, I mean, sort of a lot of love, you know, excitement then. Oh, that young monk, I think out of curiosity, looking. In any case, from my childhood, from that age, I always smile with people, with public, so people also, you see, love my smile. So whenever I, I look like that, the people express some kind of, what's the day, what's the day, no, expression of overjoy. I think around, I think, 10 years old, around 10, when, when I look this, you see, I feel the people consider or the reincarnation of high lama. But actually, that young boy, I think, think only play how to play. <laughs> so there is big contrast. <laughs> These days, there isn't quite the same spectacle when the Dalai Lama travels. Although lots of devotees turn out to see him, his bodyguards are now armed with walkie-talkies, and he travels in a modest, though bulletproof, car. Tibetan Buddhists have retained much of their culture and religious practice since going into exile. But life in Tibet before the Chinese occupation was significantly different in many ways. The Tibetan year is marked by many religious festivals. Here, at the Dalai Lama's own Namgyal Monastery, thousands of people gather to celebrate New Year. This takes place in late February early March, but sadly, far fewer festivals are celebrated now than they were in Tibet. The King's New Year Festival celebrates the Dalai Lama's position as a ruler of both church and state. The high officials wear robes whose design dates back to the seventh century, along with ancient ornaments of amber and coral which had been traded along the Silk Route and had originally come from the Mediterranean. The turquoise charm boxes around their necks and the golden bar encased in turquoise, which reaches their waist is so heavy it must be carried. The ordinary people of Lhasa gather at the foot of the potala to watch the sky dancing, a spectacle which a man scales a rope up to a tall wooden mast stands precariously on a small platform and then spins himself around. The performer is traditionally a man from one of the small villages in the region of Sang. It's done in retribution for their resistance to the rule of the fifth Dalai Lama. There's a saying in Sang, mothers don't die from illnesses, but from worry that the sons might be taken for the sky dance. The casting out of the votive offering was one of the biggest and most elaborate of the celebrations. This ceremonial military maneuver was known as the coiling snake. With civil officials acting as marshals, 500 infantry in chain mail move in a zigzag formation while another formation circles it. Seemingly chaotic was highly organized and the troops rehearsed for months to perfect it.
Hundreds of monks arrive, carrying green drums and cymbals. Next, the Torma are brought out. Tall sculptures which have a grinning skull on top and represent all evil spirits. Wearing an ornate headdress, the Nechung Oracle, a monk who has chosen for his psychic powers, appears in a state of possession. The Oracle's helmet and costume are so heavy that the medium can hardly walk in them when he's not in a trance-like state. He races around chaotically, chasing the Tormas into a clearing, accompanied by hundreds of monks and most of the population of Larsa. When the Oracle arrives, he shoots a burning arrow into bonfires which contain the evil spirits, and they're set ablaze. Many of the religious festivals had an additional civil or governmental element. At the review at Trapchi, the Tibetan cavalry assembled in front of the cabinet and government officials. The cavalry wears chain mail, steel breastplates and helmets with peacock feathers on them. The standard bearers wear special helmets which have Allah inscribed on them in gold, thought to date back to 8th century contact with Arabs. They carry tall lances wrapped in painted banners, said to have been given by the army of Genghis Khan's grandson. The cabinet wears ornate robes. Their fur-trimmed hats have silk crowns with ornaments on top of coral, turquoise and gold. A government official, followed by four junior officials, makes his report to the cabinet, announcing the number of men and horses. Shio Daji had to attend the review every year. These official functions tended to be rather long, drawn-out affairs. However, each one of us had our own responsibilities to perform. As you can see here in the film, when we junior accountants had to present the inspection report at the review at Trapchi, we had to give the full list of horsemen and their equipment. So I had feel very tense from early in the morning as I had to present the report aloud in front of a huge gathering of people. I would worry that I would make mistakes and embarrass myself, so I felt scared. I would be so terrified that time would just fly past. But when I had no responsibilities, the ceremony would get tedious and seem to go on forever. So we young ones would quietly sneak out the back for a cigarette and a chat. Another military event, the gallop round the fort, was slightly more exciting to attend. These are the special Molam Festival Cavalry. Two Yasu generals command them. Together they are being prepared to lead the presentation. There were three targets. The riders had to ride past, fire a gun, shoot an arrow and spare each one. If they managed to hit each of the targets, they would be presented with a victory scarf. The targets are hung perilously close to the spectators' heads. There is frighteningly little crowd control and serious accidents result. Finally, the competitors line up to receive their prayer scarfs. The event ends when they perform a special Mongolian salute. Other pursuits were more gentle. The people of Lhasa, rich and poor alike, took advantage of the summer festivals to enjoy their environment. During the month of celebrations to honor the Buddha's enlightenment, the government ministers and officials are rowed around a lake to make offerings. After they'd had their turn, the ordinary pilgrims were allowed to go. It's hard to believe that war was raging the rest of the world as the people of Lars are set off for their annual picnic season. 
South of Lhasa, there were many parks. During the first two weeks in May, it was picnic season. The quality of the tent depended on how rich you were. Poor people would just rig up a sheet or a small tent, but everyone went. People might picnic for one day or for longer, but on the 15th, everybody would go to their local place of worship and then come to the picnic. The nationalist Kuomintang government in China maintained its mission in Lhasa and even joined in with the Tibetan festivals. However, at home, the communists were growing in power and a civil war was raging. You see the flag there? It's the flag of the Chinese Kuomintang. In those days, the Chinese in Tibet were mainly the official representatives of the Kuomintang. The present Chinese hadn't arrived yet. Here you can see some people performing the incense burning ceremony. And here are some monks playing the long horns and the oboes. This is a group of Nangma musicians. They had their own musical association. I know one of them, the man wearing dark glasses. He's called Namgyal. He was a very well-known musician in Lhasa. He was a brilliant harmonica player. He also played the Tibetan lute and other instruments. He was blind, and that's why he wore dark glasses. Everyone knew him by his nickname, Namgyal, No Eyes. Another important summer event, and one of the Dalai Lama's favorites, was the annual opera festival held at the Norbalinka Palace. During summer in Nobulinga, I think around July or August, on summer festival, the folk dance, at, uh, and, uh, and also the every day, the military performance. So like any other child, I love, you see, the military or say, the performance. Hmm. They are well organized, they are quite smart, like that. Opera, Tibetan unique opera, is a play. So during that uh, period, I have no lesson, free holiday. Then my mother uh, often come because during that period, my family uh, stay in uh, residence in Nopulinga. Uh, they stay there a few days. So I'm very happy. Then after five days, festival finished. The next day, my lesson started. And same time, you see, the fifth day evening, my mother depart. So I feel very, <laughs> very sad. <laughs> that, that, that's the child's sort of experience like that. For the commoners in Lhasa, participation in some festival events was not really a matter of choice. For the wrestling and weightlifting, the contestants were all from the Dalai Lama's personal bodyguard regiment. So it's hard to believe, given their size and stature. The wrestling was a particularly unpopular duty, as they had to wear loincloths. It was deemed to be shameful appearing semi-naked in public, and especially in front of your superiors. For most, shyness meant they were covered up quickly. But some seemed to rather enjoy it. At the same time as a horse race is being conducted around the city, there's also a foot race. A motley group of men running brightly coloured outfits, somewhat unenthusiastically. The race is compulsory and is performed as a duty to their landlords. For the Tibetan aristocrats, there were lots of social events to attend at the British Mission, or Deki Linka. In true colonial style, 
tea was served and even darts were played. Summer was a, a period where everybody had a party to celebrate the summer and to be outdoors. This person playing the dart is my grandmother's youngest, one of the younger sisters, Delarapten, playing darts, yes. Now this looks like a party at the British legation or the British mission, the Kilinga, because it's a beautiful garden. And then the servant at the back, he's wearing the special costumes which the servants in the Sikkim royal family used to wear. So I think very much they wore this costume at the formal parties. And this looks very much like the scene. Yes, it's the senior Mrs. Lalu. She was a very special lady. She was actually a nun. And she fell in love with a member of the 13 Dalai Lama's um, family. And anyhow, she was very kind and she did everything in such a grand scale. And she, she used to visit once, once a year at our home. The British mission closed when India gained independence in 1947. Tibet still had no status as an independent nation and was not recognized internationally. The civil war between the communists and nationalists in China continued. The Tibetan government realized if the communists won, they would not tolerate their religion. However, they didn't want to be seen to be taking sides, so they politely asked the nationalist Chinese to leave Tibet. They were sent off with the utmost courtesy, with parties and free transport to the Indian border. The small Tibetan army was reorganized, new regiments were formed, and they were re-equipped. In 1949, the Chinese Civil War ended and the People's Republic of China was established under Mao Zedong's chairmanship. One of their first objectives was to bring Tibet back into what they called the motherland. On the 6th of October 1950, 40,000 Chinese soldiers of the People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet and the small Tibetan army was quickly overwhelmed and forced to surrender. The issue of the invasion was raised with the United Nations, but nothing was done. Indeed, the international community did shamefully little to help Tibet in its plight. So, the Tibetans had nothing to do but to negotiate with the Chinese. To do this, they needed a, a sole ruler. And so Dalai Lama, still with two years of training ahead of him, was rapidly giving the power to rule in Tibet. Incredible this, 16-year-old boy was suddenly made the temporal and spiritual ruler of Tibet. The teenager acted quickly and sent delegations to Britain and America, but it was the height of the Cold War and they refused to help. The Chinese, however, were happy to talk. Fearful that Chinese troops would invade Lhasa, the Dalai Lama instructed Tibetan officials in Beijing to begin negotiations. The 17-point agreement, in which Tibet was defined as being part of the Chinese motherland, was signed in Beijing without the Dalai Lama's consent. The reunification, as the Chinese called it, was completed when the invading forces reached Lhasa in October 1951, and Tibet was conquered. Samdong Rinpoche was in Lhasa at the time. At that time, there are quite a uh, sizable number of uh, Chinese military personnel uh, uh, arrived in uh, Tibet and they have set up loudspeaker radio uh, in Hasa town. So there was a lot of uh, wires going over the uh, houses and um, there's a big uh, loudspeaker. So it was not a radio but just um, propaganda through a uh, hold the town by, covered by the loudspeakers. After the Chinese arrived in 1951, everybody felt that they had lost their way. They didn't know what to do. There was a real feeling of tension and uneasiness in Lhasa. The Chinese were becoming more and more oppressive by the day. His Holiness was in a very difficult position in the face of the military power of the Chinese. Rather than resist Chinese rule, the Dalai Lama attempted to make the 17-point agreement work. 
as it was meant to allow the Tibetan government to continue running its own country. For the next three years, he set about introducing social and land reforms, attempting to propel Tibet into the 20th century. However, he still had ancient and highly demanding spiritual duties to perform. The Kalachakra ceremony, or Wheel of Time, is one of the most complex systems of theory and practice in Tibetan Buddhism. The 17-year-old Dalai Lama was initiated into this tantric tradition in front of hundreds of officials and monks at the Norbalinka Palace. I think this is the first time of a Kalachakra initiation at Norbalinka. I think 16, 17. I already, you see, took the responsibility of the Kasa, the temple or temple power. Oh, bless me. Here comes His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Here he is receiving mandala offering for long life. He's looking so young. He's not wearing glasses yet. He must be 16 or 17. Here is the Lord at the altar brother of His Holiness, Losan Samte. It must be inside the Nobulinga. This is during the Kala Jagra teachings. It looks like the people are throwing scars forward to request the teachings after the mandala ceremony. You would say prayers, then everyone would throw scarves forward. It was what everyone did in Tibet, but these days His Holiness discourages it. In 1954, the Dalai Lama received an invitation from the Chinese to go to Beijing. Most Tibetans were against the idea, fearing for his safety. The Dalai Lama, however, was determined to go, seeing it as an opportunity to be able to talk to Chairman Mao in person. Then I felt, not only me, but some officials, some high officials, uh, now two opinions. One opinion, now this is the right time, should go to Peking and meet high officials, high leaders. That some very much reluctant, very much against, I think out of fear. And my own opinion is, now better go there. Eventually, it was decided he could go, provided he returned within one year. His Holiness himself promised the people he would return within the year. I heard that when he was about to cross the Tsangpa River, people had come from Lhasa in their finest clothes. In Tibet, it is a custom for women to dress up for special journeys for good luck. They all crowded along the river bank, looking very anxious. Some were even about to throw themselves into the river in sorrow and desperation. Now, this is the, actually, you see, departing uh, uh, Lhasa to China, I think, this one. You know, uh, I like missions, or these modern things. So I love, you see, to see, uh, to visit China. But at the same time, not like just tourists, also have some responsibility. So not very certain. So all kinds of mixture feeling. Mm some hopes, some doubts, some fears, some, uh, what say they, undecisive, like that, and also some excitement. The Dalai Lama attended the first National Chinese People's Congress, which included 10 seats for the Tibetan delegation. He was impressed by Mao and felt a great affinity with many of the egalitarian principles of communism. However, at the last meeting, Mao wasted no time in giving his true opinion of Tibet and its future under Chinese rule. As the Dalai Lama left, Mao turned to him and said, religion is poison. The Dalai Lama returned home. News reached him that the Chinese authorities in eastern Tibet were confiscating lands belonging to monasteries and redistributing them amongst themselves. The situation deteriorated. 
fighting broke out between the Chinese army and Tibetan freedom fighters, and refugees began pouring into Lhasa. In the midst of this tense atmosphere, the Dalai Lama still had to take his final monastic exams, the main focus of which were public debates. Debate is a rigorous discussion of Buddha's teachings. Everything is challenged. Debate is an ancient tradition within Buddhism, which is still practiced today. Although the monks, and now nuns, are somewhat more vigorous in their style than they were in the 1950s. These monks are arguing over their personal interpretation of Buddhist texts. The skill is in arguing and using logic and your own analysis to back up your points. They are punctuated with claps to the hand. The respondent must then reply. The culmination of the Dalai Lama's 18 years of study was an examination for a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy. It started with debates at three of the largest monasteries in Tibet. Drepang Monastery had 10,000 resident monks. 8,000 of them were squeezed into the square to see the Dalai Lama as he arrived with his retinue to take his first exam. The monastery owned local estates and had some 20,000 tied peasants who worked the land and paid them taxes. The revenue paid for the prayer sessions and festivals which dominated monastic life. Feeding the monks for big events, like the examinations, was a huge, if somewhat rushed, process. The young monks run down from the cookhouse, carrying huge tubs of sampa for their brethren who are sitting in the square. Sampa is roasted barley flour mixed with yak butter, tea or water to make dough. To celebrate His Holiness's presence, the monks are also given prayer scarves, tea and money. I'm somewhere here, somewhere among this, the second row or third row I should be. And this is the Goman side. These are the government officials. Now His Holiness is offering the debate to the two abbots. During his early life, uh, he had to go to uh, China and he had to go to India and he had so many uh, things to attend. So then uh, he did not have time to study. Oh, now this about top scholar, Mongolian, and also he, when he, Kazoda, mm, he asked question very uh, rapidly. Mm. So a bit more nervous. Uh, so I have mm, <laughs> a little uh, opportunity to think how to trick to him. <laughs> One top scholar, you see, very rapidly, you see, putting question, question. Then no time, is it? <laughs> how, to, how to pretend or how to, how to defend like that. Uh, so now this is my turn, debate. Oh, uh, of course, we have received a lot of teaching from His Holiness, and we know he is a very great scholar. But uh, he was not joined in the uh, monastic debate. We thought he may not be very sharp in the, <laughs> in the debate. But for the first time, we saw when he was examined by the abbots, he was uh, brilliant and absolutely uh, um, sharp. 
equal with those who are uh, debating the monastery for a lifetime and uh, the abbots find it quite difficult to, uh, to debate with him. The next exam was at Sarah Monastery. The whole of the Dalai Lama's government traveled with him, allowing him to consult with them about the growing tension in Lhasa. At the same time, he had to prepare for the next series of debates. But the abbots each had their own individual style of arguing. In Sarah Monastery, you see, when you debate with the opponent, good scholar, then their answer is something logical or something, you see, they, uh, valid. Uh, meaningful. In Sarah Monastery, one about not that much scholar, not, not that top. So you see, they, from my side, you see, the preparation, if answer come this way, yes, this is the way to argue. If this way, uh, if answer has come this, uh, this kind of answer, then yes, already prepared. And his answer, unexpected answer. <laughs> so then my, my tutor, Notice that, then he very kindly stopped, now finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's tremendous relief. <laughs> the last of preliminary exams was some distance from Lhasa, at Ganden Monastery. Ironically, the examinations at Ganden proved to be a brief period of respite for Dalai Lama. Thousands more refugees had fled the fighting in the east and arrived in Lhasa. A huge number are now camped around the outskirts of the city. Tensions with the occupying Chinese, who'd been in Tibet for about nine years, were high. There were food shortages in Lhasa and rumours about massacres in eastern Tibet and also rumours about the destruction of sacred sites. Meanwhile, the Dalai Lama still had his final exam to take. The Dalai Lama returned to Lhasa and continued to prepare for his final exam. Amidst increasingly disturbing reports of Chinese atrocities, he attempted to concentrate on his studies. He took solace in Buddhist teachings that one's enemy is one's greatest teacher and to have compassion for all sentient beings. The final exam was arranged to take place at the same time as a Mulam New Year festival. There were 30,000 monks in the city and pilgrims were arriving from all over Tibet. The Jokang temple was full to bursting. The cabinet, civil officials, and all the senior abbots and monks were present. At that time, things were very tense. On the one hand, a very solemn and grand ceremony was taking place. On the other hand, we were in a very dangerous and tense situation. There are a lot of rumors about danger to uh, his security, and uh, the uh, threat perception was very high. And therefore, it was a very tight security arrangements are used to be there, and that, that was a bit annoying. And it, that was not... Uh, 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 not a uh, consonance with the monastic atmosphere. So a lot of um, uh, soldiers with uh, guns uh, and uh, very attentive and uh, uh, with uh, walkie-talkies. These are not familiar with the people. So uh, that was uh, a tense and also the joyful. These are going together. Gun emplacements were built. There were Chinese carrying rifles patrolling the rooftops opposite. Everyone, government officials, the clergy, the people, were there for the religious function of the 13th. But they saw clearly the Chinese soldiers walking around on the rooftops. I was involved in organizing the event. In this emergency situation, there was nothing we could do. We asked some of the Hmong officials to disguise themselves as ordinary people and mingle with the public and to act like spies. 
On the one hand, the ordinary people and their aristocrats were all dressed up in their finest. On the other, right next door, the Chinese were making elaborate military preparations, with soldiers carrying rifles as if they might attack at any moment. It was unbelievable that these two extraordinary situations could be happening at the same time. The position between the Chinese and the Tibetans was becoming irreconcilable. It was an incredible situation that was unfolding. If you had told an outsider, they wouldn't believe you. But that's how it was. One aspect the whole atmosphere is so tense. Many people actually felt whether this big gathering can take place or not because of so much tense. But then everything go very smoothly. So everybody very happy. My final examination, successful. I think very successful. And also, uh, I myself, now, from the corner of my mind, another thing is, now, uh, no more any lesson. <laughs> the Dalai Lama returned to the Norbalinka with his full retinue, but this time he was accompanied by armed guards. Little did he know that this 1,000-year-old ceremonial procession through Lhasa would be his last. The Chinese Governor General of Tibet invited Dalai Lama to see a dance troupe at the Chinese military headquarters. In the name of dispensing with formality, the Chinese requested that he attend with unarmed bodyguards. Why that a refusal would worsen the fragile situation, the Dalai Lama accepted, but the news soon spread. The Tibetan people came pouring into the Nobulinka, and their spokesmen forced their way into our official meetings. So His Holiness didn't go. This meant that any communication between the Chinese and the Tibetans had completely broken down. As this had happened, everybody felt it wasn't safe for His Holiness to stay. You could never tell what the Chinese might do. So everyone wanted him to leave as soon as possible. Although that was what everyone was thinking and what everybody wanted, no one dared say it out loud. We were all terrified. The Dalai Lama received news that the Chinese were planning to attack the crowd surrounding the Norbalinka and bomb the building. Convinced that if he left, the people would be saved, he decided he had to leave. Of course, I think top most in my mind is fear sadness and almost like the feeling of desperate and also leaving some of my close friends sweepers or some monks who look after temples or the libraries in Nulinga and including my dog So as a human level, very sad, one factor. Then also, uh, several thousand Tibetan, you see, suppose uh, different Nobulinga already get there. So that also additional worry. If something happen, then thousands of people will die. Then also, uh, my own life, there is danger. One person's sort of future, but the future of Tibet also is related. So therefore, anxiety, fear, little doubt, hesitation, and sadness, all mixed, very much mixed. That night, the Dalai Lama escaped from the Norbalinka disguised as a Tibetan soldier. I had an indescribable feeling. On the one hand, I was exultant that His Holiness was able to leave. On the other hand, I was very sad when I saw him. Unlike the usual protocol and fanfare, 
He left wearing an ordinary brown uniform, carrying a rifle like a soldier. The next day, reach uh, southern Tibet. Then fear of my life, then no longer. Then we have no hesitation to criticize <laughs> about our Chinese brothers and sisters. <laughs> While in Lhasa, uh, although sometimes we criticize, but uh, from one corner of our mind, uh, we, oh, oh, be careful, be careful, be careful, or oh, that kind of sort of situation. Then it, as soon as we reach uh, southern Tibet, the free from Chinese forces, we get some, oh, some, some extraordinary feeling now, free, freedom. Two weeks later, after an arduous journey through the Himalayas, the Dalai Lama reached safety in northern India. That morning, around dawn, he began shelling the noble Inca. At around 9 or 10, I went to Chokpuri Hill to the defensive position I had been assigned to monitor. When I looked towards the Potala, I saw there was a huge fire in the eastern wing. Near the account section, a huge fire. The Keno bombardment started from the bottom of the hills upwards. That was followed by the rat -a -tat -tat of the machine gun fire. It was relentless. In any case, eventually, even the Tsulakam was taken over and completely looted. Everything except for the George statue and the Sunze chapel, it was left like an empty shell. Everything else was destroyed. It was taken over by the Chinese soldiers and turned into, what's the word in Chinese? A trote. We weren't allowed in because it was turned into a military barracks and heavily guarded. Then around 4 or 5 in the evening, when I looked across at the Ramakang ferry crossing, I saw large numbers of Tibetan horsemen, foot soldiers and ordinary people. Many of them were from the Tibetan volunteer force. Then the relentless bombardment began. In the dust and smoke, I saw people and horses falling. The intense bombardment went on for about an hour or two. That day, over a thousand of our people were killed. I saw it all with my very own eyes. The Tibetan resistance, made up of freedom fighters and monks, who had taken up arms for the first time in their lives, were no match for the Chinese army. They surrendered after three days. The Tibetan government was abolished, and the Chinese systematically began to destroy Tibetan society and its Buddhist culture and traditions. Monasteries were looted and scriptures burned. Nuns and monks were forced to denounce their faith. They were also made to discard their robes and grow their hair. They were even forced to marry each other. Class resentment amongst the peasants over Tibet's feudal system was ruthlessly exploited. The government officials and aristocrats had their long hair shaved off, were imprisoned or forced to do menial jobs. They were subjected to public interrogation sessions, many resulting in death. The Indian government granted the Dalai Lama political asylum, and 80,000 refugees escaped from Tibet to join him. He has lived here in Dharamsala, known as Little Lhasa, ever since. The Dalai Lama appealed to the United Nations, calling on China to respect the human rights of Tibetans and their desire for self-determination. Despite three resolutions adopted by the UN General Assembly, the fact that thousands of monasteries were destroyed and hundreds of thousands of Tibetans were imprisoned in labor camps, the international community refused to intervene. 
It's tragic that Tibetans have lost their homeland and with no tangible international intervention. But coming here, looking around, one can see that despite everything, Tibetans retain their sense of national identity, their culture and their pride. Looking at this pictures that you have here in front of me, it's entirely a different world. And it was, to me, it's very sad. Uh, for instance, like my grandfather wanted Tibet. I get very emotional to talk about Tibet, you know. Uh, my grandfather wanted Tibet to be with the outside world and to join the United Nations, to educate the Tibetans outside and to be with the modern world. But his visions and his um, wishes, and also his 13th Dalai Lama and the 14th Dalai Lama had a wish that we must have contact with the international world. But unfortunately, from our own side, we were so blind and we knew nothing of the outside world. We were just so engrossed in our little pond, you know, so we knew nothing, what was happening to the world, what, what could happen, and so we lost our country. The Dalai Lama advocates a middle way, which means he wants Tibetans to move back to Tibet even if they become a minority within China, but a minority with a degree of self-rule. He remains determined that the dialogue between the Chinese and the Tibetans remains peaceful and positive. Middle of approach is the best. So present Chinese government policy regarding uh, different minorities, particularly regarding Tibet, is not healthy or not good for long run. So kind of op new opinions as a result of uh, better awareness now coming. So therefore, basically, I'm hopeful. Thank you. Funtsog Sering escaped to India in 1959. He is now the Dalai Lama's personal tailor. Shuo Lobsang Daji spent 15 years in a Chinese prison in Lhasa. He escaped to India in 1985 and became the Chief Justice Commissioner for the Tibetan government in exile. Usha Nawang Tashi escaped to India in 1959. He retired as a chum teacher in 1990. The Venerable Jampa Sultram served 20 years in a Chinese prison in Lhasa. He escaped in 1980 and worked at Dalai Lama's private office. The Venerable Tenzin Chonyi Tara escaped from Tibet in 1959 and worked for the Dalai Lama's private office until he retired in 2003. Jampa Chodin was forced to give up being a nun and marry a monk. She escaped to India in 1984. Professor Sam Dong Rinpoche escaped to India in 1959. He is now the Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile. Nambigal Takla left Tibet in 1956. She has lived in Switzerland, America, and now India, working for the Tibetan government in exile. This is Tibet in the 1930s, a beautiful isolated land high up in the mountain range of the Himalayas. Surrounded by the empires of Britain and China and yet still almost completely untouched by the outside world. Tibet is now most famous for its leader, the Dalai Lama, who was forced into exile nearly 50 years ago. 
This treasure trove of rare colour films, filmed by British, Chinese and Tibetans who lived through these times, have been preserved by the British Film Institute. These films allow us to glimpse into a world which has almost entirely disappeared, to a time before the Dalai Lama and his people lost their country. Oh, father. I think my father. The Dalai Lama escaped to India in 1959 and along with the Tibetan government in exile is based in Makloid Ganj in northern India. To understand how Tibet was lost and why the Dalai Lama must live in exile, we have to look back to a time when Tibet was a free nation. This is Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, in the early 1940s. This film is of the main shopping street known as the Barkor. Despite being shot in the 20th century, it looks medieval. Hardly surprising given its geographical position in the Himalayas. It was almost impossible to reach and so remained frozen in time. Namgyal Takla lived in Tibet in the 1940s. We had the huge mountains surrounding Tibet and then we were inside this mountain, isolated. And uh, we had the big Russia, China, Britain ar around us. And it was the policy to be kept, this country to be kept a buffer state, a sort of a zone where the big powers will not meet. And it was, we lived in, in, in the 20th century, we maybe have lived like we were in the 16th century. Originally nomadic, Tibetan society became feudal and deeply religious. The introduction of Buddhism to Tibet had a profound effect on both its culture and traditions. Ruled by a dual system combining aristocratic families and Buddhist monks, the government's main function was to maintain the religious state. Any attempts to modernise or invite foreign influence were resisted by this conservative and profoundly religious outlook. Life in Lhasa was dominated by a huge number of religious festivals, which involved most of the city's population. Sixty-eight days a year were taken up with these festivals. Since the Chinese occupation of Tibet, all of these festivals have been banned. Even though life for exiled Tibetans has changed enormously since the Chinese invasion, Tibetan culture is still deeply religious and Buddhism is central to its way of life. Tibetan prayer flags still hang in holy places. Each time the wind blows, the prayers that are written on them are released into the universe. Buddhism arrived in Tibet in the 7th century, a thousand years after it began in India. Focusing on the attainment of a deep understanding into the true nature of life, all Buddhists believe that the path to true enlightenment is through the practice and development of morality, meditation and wisdom. At the time these films were made, monks made up 20% of the male Tibetan population. Every Tibetan family, rich or poor, sent their youngest son to a monastery as a spiritual and religious duty. Because monks had a higher social status than peasants, poor families readily gave up their boys in the knowledge that they would be looked after financially for life. These boys would have just arrived at the monastery. Some were as young as seven. Even though in theory they could give up being monks if they wanted, they'd expect to stay there for the rest of their lives. In a tradition that dates back to the 17th century, the Dalai Lama, or Ocean of Wisdom, 
is both the spiritual and secular leader of Tibet. The present Dalai Lama, who is the 14th, was found while he was still a small child. All Buddhists believe in rebirth and reincarnation. But the man they refer to as His Holiness is something very special. Some even see him as a god-king. He is the reincarnation of all the previous Dalai Lamas, an enlightened being, the bodhisattva of compassion, who returns to the human world to help others. When the 13th Dalai Lama died, his reincarnation, a three-year-old boy called Tenzin Gyatso, was found some 600 miles from the capital in Amdo, a province in the far northeast, close to the Chinese border. While the Western world was at war, Tenzin and his family made the long journey to Lhasa. The 14th Dalai Lama arrived in October 1940. By now, he was five years old. He was accompanied by his father, mother and two elder brothers, Lobsan Santen and Gyalu Thondup. Oh, oh, father? I think my, my father. Father, yes. Oh, my mother. Oh, this is elder brother. Whom I bully. <laughs> My mother, very, very gentle. Almost I never saw her sort of the mental state of temper. I never saw. Very gentle. Always smile. Something very, very nice, very nice woman. A villager, uneducated. At the beginning, illiterate. Later, with her own effort, she can read uh, some books. Now here, yes, my father with moustache. Uh, he very much interest keep his moustache very, how say, they, very organized, organized way. Uh, no, not like that. So uh, he used, of course, our family from time to time eating meat. Uh, uh, with bone, uh, so every time uh, from the bone mm, there is something, uh, what what called, Mer marrow or something. Oh. So see, he usually is put on his moustache, then do like that. From the moment the young Dalai Lama was found, he was revered as a god-king. While he was their religious leader, he would not become head of state until he reached 18, and years of monastic study lay ahead of him. The balance of power between the government and the religious elite was maintained through the ceremonies and rituals that dominated life in Tibet. The strict adherence to protocol is clearly illustrated by the Mulam Chenmo, or Great Prayer Festival a series of events which commemorates the day when Buddha preached the Dharma, or sacred text, for the first time. The festival starts when the monks take over the running of Lhasa from the government. The proctors of the Drepung Monastery arrive carrying heavy silver maces to demand that power is handed over to them by the Kashag, or parliament. The proctors are accompanied by the Dobdobs, or monastic police, huge monks who carry long sticks and whips. The head dobdob -dob carries the biggest stick, of course. Wearing padded robes, their cheeks blackened, their job is to intimidate and control the crowd of 20,000 monks who flood the city for the festival. Gifts of money and food were handed out during the Great Prayer. Most of them were funded by the Tibetan government. At the end of the festival, power was handed back to the government, which was dominated by a group of aristocratic families. There were about 200 families who made up the civil service, and each of them had to provide a son to serve as an official. 
Within the aristocracy, there were 30 higher status families who had the most senior positions. Namgyal Takla is from one of these families, the Tsarongs. Oh, that's our house, <laughs> the, the house I was born in, the Tsarong house. And that's my uh, aunt, Kukula, and that's my mother. They're really modeling away. It seems quite strange that they are modeling because it's never, we never even heard of this in Tibet, nor did anybody do that, you know. It's, it's, it seems quite strange. I'm sure Auntie Kukula must have uh, arranged this. And I don't know who took the picture, but it's very beautiful, very beautiful. I think they had a British governess, and so she, she must have taught my mother how to walk. <laughs> because I, do, I can't imagine my mother, you know, sort of showing her clothes. Yeah, they're wearing the Lhasa uh, ceremonial costumes. Kukula is considered very beautiful, and she, she's really beautiful in here, I must say. And you notice here, the, uh, oh, this is also in our garden. We had one of the best gardens also in Lhasa, because my grandfather himself, he worked in the, in the garden, and uh, also he made all the family members come and work. And we, each child had a tree. We had to water the tree, fertilize it, and we were only allowed to take the fruits of that tree and not, not, no fruits from the other trees. So we had strawberries, we had gooseberries, we had pears, everything. In this picture, you see my aunts together with my grandfather and my um, uh, grandmother. They had the same father, Tsarong, but their mother, they had three different mothers. They were three sisters from the Tsarong, original Tsarong family. This sort of family structure was not unusual in Tibet. Men could marry a number of women, and even women could marry a number of men. The reason is to keep the family wealth together. Married out the brothers, had several wives, they're, they're bound to be troubles, and then they might say, okay, we want to separate the land. So they usually had brothers marry one daughter or the daughters marrying several brothers, so on. It was very common. Divorce did exist, and, and usually what happened was before, during marriage, there is a contract made. And then usually most of the divorces, the wife would be well looked after when she leaves the home. And if there's a son, the son stays with the father and the daughter stays with the mother. So there's no custody of children fighting about it. Automatically, the daughter goes to the mother, the son goes to the father. They could also remarry. We had no problems about divorces or widows remarrying. In, in fact, if they were younger, they were encouraged to marry. The five-year-old Dalai Lama was about to lead, spiritually if not politically, the massive civil and monastic bureaucracy within Lhasa. Before his official enthronement, he stayed at the summer palace, the Norbalinka. At first, his family were also allowed to stay there, before he began his new life. Of course, at that time, my mother and father and my other brother remain or stay with me. Then mother and father, uh, uh, I think every day is they come to see me. And also, I also visited uh, to their home. I enjoy my native village's food. While pilgrims flocked from all over Tibet to be blessed by their god king, he received important international visitors, and it was customary to bear gifts. The British political officer in nearby Sikkim brought a movie camera with him and managed to get this first ever moving picture of the Dalai Lama. Sir Basil Gould, seen here with the white prayer scarf around his neck, also brought an expensive foreign toy car for the little boy. But already, his status set him apart from other children, and only his older brother, Lobsang, was allowed to test drive it. Oh, this is my brother, elder brother. So the people felt, if I handle maybe too risk, so my elder brother let him, you see, play. Sometimes I feel a little jealousy. <laughs> Somebody's in the car, 
I wonder if that is my husband. It's him. <laughs> Namgyal married the Dalai Lama's older brother, Lobsang, in 1962, after he had given up being a monk. There's Lobsang on the horse now. I, I see him. Lobsang's so serious. I can't believe it. He looks so serious in there. He's not a serious person, but in there he looks so serious. Now, that, that is a very nice picture, yes, of um, Lobsang's father with his mother going in front of him. One wonderful thing about my mother-in-law, which I really admire, is she loved wearing her own simple jewellery and the dresses. She was a wonderful person, very simple, and from, from a small village, but she was sort of always so kind to everybody. If somebody, a beggar, came to the home and asked for something, she'd ask the cook to please feed the person, whoever it was. And she was really kind to everybody. Wonderful person. Oh, there's a picture now with the, the family. Lobsang's father, mother, Lobsang, and uh, Jitsun Pema. And Jitsun Pema's niece, my husband's niece, Kandu. Um, I don't know where it's taken, but it's in their ceremonial dresses. The date for the 14th Dalai Lama's enthronement ceremony at the Potala Palace was reached according to complex astrological calculations. The distance between the Norbalinka Palace and the Potala is only a few miles. The Dalai Lama would be accompanied on this short journey by the whole of his monastic and civil retinue. The 13-storey palace was built in the 7th century. A quarter of a mile long with over a thousand rooms, it covered the whole of Lhasa's Red Hill. It was the winter residence of the Dalai Lama, a place of religious worship and training, as well as being the centre of the Tibetan government and its huge civil service. Tenzin Gyatso was enthroned as the 14th Dalai Lama on the 22nd of February, 1940. A life of austerity and strict scholarly pursuit began for five-year-old Tenzin and his brother Lobsang. Well, I think for him, being a normal child and then suddenly becoming a monk and then coming up to Lhasa with His Holiness and uh, leaving the parents and then suddenly going into this huge Portola Palace and living there amidst the older monks who can be quite strict. And he, and he used to often tell me it wasn't that um, pleasant there. The elder brother stayed with me. We always play. Uh, and sometimes I bully on him, <laughs> although he's <laughs> older than me. <laughs> he used to talk about uh, his holiness being quite naughty and mischievous. And then when he was naughty, his tutors used to uh, frighten Lobsang. And then he said, then his holiness he used to get into a lot of uh, very nice games, running around and then feeding the birds outside on the roofs. That was the greatest fun. Here were these two little boys with the older uh, attendants and huge dark rooms and it was very frightening for them. And I mean, coming from a village where you had a lot of uh, running around freedom and then suddenly you are put there. It must have been quite intimidating for him. So then I think once a month, my mother came. So when my mother came, I feel very happy. Then my mother uh, about depart. I feel a little, mm, little uncomfortable, a little sad. While the boy studied, a monk regent took the role of Tibet's temporal leader until the Dalai Lama reached the age of majority. Regent Retting, accompanied by his enormous bodyguard, Atugba, oversaw much of this power vacuum. But his regime was seen as corrupt. He was displaced and then eventually imprisoned after an attempted coup. He died in jail. While the young Dalai Lama had to wait to take full political power, as the country's spiritual leader, he acted as a figurehead, and one of his duties was attending cabinet meetings. His strict routine only varied when there were important festivals to attend. The festival of the votive offering took place in the eastern courtyard of the Potala Palace. 
It was a deeply significant, solemn occasion in which all of the sins and bad events from the previous year were purged, clearing the way for the next. The yellow-hatted monks of the Dalai Lama's own Namgyal Monastery arrive and they join the government and civil officials as they prostrate themselves in front of His Holiness. Watching from the top floor whose balconies are hidden behind yellow silk awnings is the Dalai Lama. The main event is the Chum, a tantric dance. Accompanied by drums and trumpets, dancers of the Dalai Lama's monastery descend the stairs and enter the courtyard. They have spent many hours in meditation, envisaging themselves as the deities they are about to perform. The Chum dance for the votive offering is performed on the last day of the Tibetan calendar. The monks who dance the Chum will have spent years in training, not only in the steps and movements of the dance, but also in the inner meaning of each gesture. The principal character, the stag, is danced by a young monk aged 12 or 13. Ringed around him are 22 black hat dancers and 16 masked dancers. The dance is performed as an auspicious ritual to bring good fortune for the coming new year and to clear away all negative elements from the last. At the end of the ceremony, a cathartic fire purification rite is performed. A human skull filled with alcohol is poured into a pot of burning oil and the last traces of evil are dispelled. Tibetan Buddhism differs from other types because it has its roots in the earlier Bon religion. This brings with it a belief in gods and celestial beings, as well as various traditions that involve all of Tibetan society. Tibetans believe that their prayers are given added power by being conducted by a prayer wheel. Prayer wheels can contain up to a mile of written prayers. They are symbolically recited with every turn. Pilgrims earn merit and concentrate their minds on the mantras they are reciting as they turn the wheel. The circular five-mile holy walk which surrounded Lhasa was known as the Lingkor. On festival days like the anniversary of the Buddha's enlightenment, pilgrims would start early in the morning. Many would give money, tea or food to the beggars who would line the route. Artemisia, scrub rhododendron and juniper twigs were burnt and the air would be filled with incense. Some pilgrims would prostrate themselves. Prostration is a spiritual act where pilgrims move forward, ritually laying their bodies on the ground. Forwards prostration would take a pilgrim about six or seven days to complete the whole route. A new linkor has been created in McLeod Gange to replace the sacred path lost in Lhasa. And while pilgrims don't prostrate themselves on the linkor anymore, people still give money to beggars. These days, however, the beggars are Indians and the pilgrims giving money are Tibetan refugees. The cabinet and senior civil officials also walk the linkor on festival days. But they would get very hot in their heavy ceremonial costumes and so would stop off at the British mission for a cup of tea. Historically, the British and Chinese were officially represented in Tibet. British pressure to allow trading had led to the establishment of a new British trade mission in 1937, and in the mid-1940s, a Chinese representative arrived in Lhasa. Relations with the British were cordial, while they were more tense with the Chinese. Dr Sung Lian Shen is seen here being welcomed by Jigme Tering, the Tibetan finance minister. Although they shared a religion, Buddhism, as a Chinese nationalist, Shen considered Tibet to be part of China. Aside from diplomatic toing and froing, life in Lhasa continued according to ancient custom and practice. The Dalai Lama lived in the Potala during the winter and the Norbalinka during the summer. Twice a year, the civil and religious hierarchy accompanied him on his move from palace to palace. 
identified by the peacock for the umbrella, which accompanied his sedan chair or palanquin. The whole population of Lhasa watched silently for a glimpse of his holiness. We used to also stand in line with the crowd and view and get a blessing from his holiness while he was in the palanquin, because everything was so silent, incense burning and people very quiet and trying hard to get a glimpse of him. And at the end, they would have the army band coming, which was more fun, I mean, sort of a lot of love, you know, excitement then. Oh, that young monk, I think out of curiosity, looking. In any case, from my childhood, from that age, I always smile with people, with public. So people also, you see, love my smile. So whenever I, I look like that, the people express some kind of what's the day, what's the day, no, expression of overjoy. I think around, I think, 10 years old, around 10, when, when I look this, you see, I feel the people consider or the reincarnation of High Lama. But actually, that young boy, I think, think only play how to play. <laughs> so there is big contrast. <laughs> the King's New Year Festival celebrates the Dalai Lama's position as the ruler of both church and state. The high officials have robes dating back to the 7th century, wearing ancient ornaments of amber and coral, which had been traded along the Silk Route. They had originally come from the Mediterranean. The turquoise charm boxes around their necks and the golden bar encased in turquoise which reaches their waist is so heavy it must be carried. The ordinary people of Lhasa gather at the foot of the potala to watch the sky dancing. A spectacle in which a man scales a rope up to a tall wooden mast, stands precariously on a small platform and then spins himself around on it. The performer is traditionally a man from one of the small villages in the region of Tsang. It's done in retribution for their resistance to the rule of the fifth Dalai Lama in the 17th century. There is a saying in Tsang that mothers do not die from illnesses, but from worry that their sons might be taken for the sky dance. The casting out of the votive offering was one of the biggest and most elaborate of the year's celebrations. This ceremonial representation of a military manoeuvre was known as the coiling snake. Then hundreds of monks arrive carrying green drums and cymbals. Next, the torma are brought out, tall sculptures which have grinning skulls on top and represent evil. A monk, chosen for his psychic powers, known as the Nechung Oracle, appears in a state of possession and rushes through the crowd. The Oracle is dressed in an elaborate costume, including a heavy harness and a huge helmet. The costume is so heavy that the medium can hardly walk in it when he is not in his trance-like state. He races around chaotically, chasing the tormas or evil spirits into a clearing accompanied by hundreds of monks and most of the population of Lhasa. When the oracle arrives, he shoots a burning arrow into bonfires, which contain the Tormas, and they are set ablaze. Many of the religious festivals had an additional civil or governmental element. At the review at Trapchi, the Tibetan cavalry assemble for a ceremonial march past in front of the cabinet and other government officials. The cavalry are dressed in chain mail, steel breastplates and helmets with peacock feathers on them. The standard bearers wear special helmets which have Allah inscribed on them in gold, thought to date back to 8th century contact with Arabs. They carry tall lances wrapped in painted banners said to have been given by the army of Genghis Khan's grandson. The cabinet wear robes with a heavy fur collar and cuffs. Their fur-trimmed hats have silk crowns with gold and turquoise ornaments and a coral button on top. 
A government official, followed by four junior officials, makes his report to the Cabinet, announcing the number of men and horses. The cavalry then march past the Cabinet in ceremonial style. Summer in Lhasa was a time for festivals which both the rich and poor alike could enjoy. During the picnic season, most of the population would pitch tents in one of the parks southeast of the city. The tents range from the elaborate to a simple sheet. Famous Nangma musicians played Tibetan flutes and harmonicas for the picnickers. Incense burning ceremonies were performed while monks sat in tents playing long horns and oboes. Even the Kuomintang government of China, who had a mission in Lhasa, joined in with the fun. While at home, the communists were growing in power and a civil war was raging. Another important summer event and one of the Dalai Lama's favourites was the annual opera festival held at the Norbalinka Palace. During summer, Norbalinka, I think around July or August, on summer festival, the folk dance, uh, and, uh, and also, the every day, the military performance. So like any other child, I love, you see, the military or say, the performance. Mm. They are well organized. They are quite smart, like that. <laughs> opera, Tibetan unique opera, is a play. So during that uh, period, I have no lesson, free, holiday, then my mother uh, often come because during that period my family uh, stay in uh, residence in Nopulinga. Uh, they stay there a few days. So I'm very happy. Then after five days, Festival finish. The next day, my lesson started. And same time, you see, the fifth day evening, my mother depart. So I feel very, <laughs> very sad. <laughs> that, that, that's the child's sort of experience like that. For the commoners of Lhasa, participation in some festival events was not really a matter of choice. For the wrestling and weightlifting, the contestants were from the Dalai Lama's personal bodyguard regiment, though it's hard to believe given their size and stature. The wrestling was a particularly unpopular duty, as they had to wear loincloths. It was deemed to be very shameful appearing semi-naked in public, and especially in front of your superiors. To preserve their dignity, Minders would rush out to cover them. At the same time, a series of races were being conducted around the city. One of them was a foot race. A bit of a motley crew, they ranged from the very aged to the very young. They ran in brightly coloured outfits, somewhat unenthusiastically. The race was compulsory, performed as a duty to their landlords. For the Tibetan aristocrats, there were lots of social events to attend at the British Mission or Deki Linka. In true colonial style, tea parties were held. Summer was a, a period where everybody had a party to celebrate the summer and to be outdoors. This person playing the dart is my grandmother's youngest, one of the younger sisters. They let up then, playing darts, yes. Now this looks like a party at the British legation or the British mission, the Kilinga, because it's a beautiful garden. And then the servant at the back, he's wearing the special costumes which the servants in the Sikkim royal family used to wear. So I think very much they wore this costume at the formal parties. And this looks very much like the senior, yes, it's the senior Mrs. Lalu. She was, uh, very special lady. She was actually a nun, and she fell in love with a member of the 13 Dalai Lama's um, family. And anyhow, she was very kind, and she did everything in such a grand scale. 
and she, she used to visit once, once a year at our home. The British mission closed when India gained independence in 1947. Tibet still had no status as an independent nation and was not recognised internationally. The civil war between the communists and the nationalists in China continued. The Tibetan government realised that if the communists won, they would not tolerate their religion. However, they did not want to be seen to be taking sides, so they politely asked the nationalist Chinese to leave Tibet. The small Tibetan army was reorganised, new regiments were formed and they were re-equipped. In 1949, the Chinese Civil War ended and the People's Republic of China was established under Mao Zedong's chairmanship. One of their first objectives was to bring Tibet back into the motherland. On the 6th of October 1950, 40,000 Chinese soldiers of the People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet and the small Tibetan army surrendered. Tibet appealed to the United Nations for help, but to no avail. Abandoned by the international community, the Tibetans had no course open to them but to negotiate with the Chinese, but they needed a sole ruler. So the 16-year-old Dalai Lama was made the spiritual and temporal leader of Tibet. The Dalai Lama acted quickly and sent delegations to Britain and America. But it was the height of the Cold War and the Allies refused to help. The Chinese, however, were happy to talk. Fearful that Chinese troops would invade Lhasa, the Dalai Lama instructed Tibetan officials in Beijing to begin negotiations. The 17-point agreement in which Tibet was defined as being part of the Chinese motherland was signed in Beijing without the Dalai Lama's consent. The long-awaited reunification, as the Chinese called it, was completed when their troops invaded Lhasa in October 1951. Professor Samdong Rinpoche was in Lhasa at the time. At that time, there are quite a sizable number of uh, Chinese military personnel uh, uh, arrived in uh, Tibet and they have set up loudspeaker radio uh, in Lhasa town. So there was a lot of uh, wires going over the uh, houses and um, there's a big uh, loudspeaker. So it was not a radio, but just um, propaganda through a whole the town by, covered by the loudspeakers. The 17-point agreement was meant to allow the Tibetan government to continue running its own country. So the Dalai Lama immediately set about introducing both social and land reforms. While he was attempting to propel Tibet into the 20th century, he still had ancient and highly demanding spiritual duties to perform. The Kala Chakra ceremony, or Wheel of Time, is one of the most complex systems of theory and practice of Tibetan Buddhism. The 17-year-old Dalai Lama was initiated into this tantric tradition in front of hundreds of officials and lay monks at the Norbalinka Palace. I think this is the first time of a Kala Chakra initiation at Norbalinka. I think 16, 17. I already, you see, took the responsibility of the Kasa, the temporal, or temporal power. In 1954, the Dalai Lama received an invitation from the Chinese to go to Beijing. While many Tibetans feared for his safety, the Dalai Lama was determined to go, seeing it as an opportunity to be able to talk to Chairman Mao in person. Then I felt, not only me, but some officials, some high officials, uh, now two opinions. One opinion, now this is the right time, should go to Peking and meet high officials, high leaders. That some very much reluctant, very much against, I think out of fear. And my own opinion is, now better go there. The Tibetans were terrified at the thought of the Dalai Lama leaving the country, but he promised he would return within the year. 
Hundreds of people travelled from Lhasa and crowded the riverbanks to watch him leave and pray for his safe return. Now this is the, actually, you see, departing uh, uh, Lhasa to China. I think this one. You know, uh, I like missions, or these modern things. So I love you see, to see, uh, to visit China. But at the same time, not like just tourists, also have some responsibility. So not very certain. So all kinds of mixture feeling. Mm. Some hopes, some doubts, some fears, some, uh, what say they, undecisive, like that. And also some excitement. The Dalai Lama attended the first National Chinese People's Congress, which included 10 seats for the Tibetan delegation. He was impressed by Mao and felt a great affinity with many of the egalitarian principles of communism. However, at their last meeting, Mao gave his true opinion of Tibet and its future under Chinese rule. As the Dalai Lama left, Mao turned to him and said, religion is poison. <laughs> The Dalai Lama returned to Tibet. News reached him that the Chinese authorities in the east were confiscating lands belonging to monasteries and redistributing them amongst themselves. Fighting broke out between the Chinese army and the Tibetan freedom fighters, and refugees began pouring into Lhasa. In the midst of this tense atmosphere, the Dalai Lama still had to take his final monastic exams. The main focus of the exams were public debates. Debate is an ancient tradition within Buddhism, which is still practiced today. Although the monks and now nuns are somewhat more vigorous in their style than they were in the 1950s. These monks are arguing over their personal interpretation of Buddhist texts. The skill is in arguing and using logic to back up your points with your own analysis and involves constant re-evaluation. The points are punctuated with claps of the hand. The respondent must then reply with theirs. The culmination of the Dalai Lama's 18 years of study was an examination for a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy. This started with debates at three of the largest monasteries in Tibet. Drepung Monastery had 10,000 resident monks. 8,000 of them were squeezed into the square outside the main hall to see the Dalai Lama as he arrived with his retinue to take his first exam. The monastery owned local estates and had some 20,000 tied peasants who worked the land and paid them taxes. The revenue paid for the prayer sessions and festivals which dominated monastic life. Feeding the monks for big events like the examinations was a huge, if somewhat rushed, process. The young monks run down from the cookhouse carrying huge tubs of sampa to their brethren who are sitting in the square. Sampa, the staple diet of Tibetans, is made of roasted barley flour mixed with yak butter, tea or water to make dough. To celebrate His Holiness's presence, the monks are also given prayer scarves, tea and money. I'm somewhere here, somewhere among this, the second row or third row I should be. And this is the Goman side. These are the government officials. Now His Holiness is offering the debate to the two abbots. During his early life, uh, he have to go to uh, China and he have to go to India and he have so many uh, things to attend. So then uh, he did not have time to study. Oh, now this about top scholar, Mongolian. And also he, when he, Kasoda, he asked question very rapidly. 
tell Chir said. So a bit more nervous. Uh, so I have <laughs> had a little uh, uh, opportunity to think how to trick to, <laughs> to him. <laughs> One top scholar, you see, very rapidly, you see, putting question, question. Then no time, you see, <laughs> how, to, how to pretend or how to, uh, how to defend like that. Uh, so now this is my turn, a debate. Oh, of course, we have received a lot of teaching from His Holiness, and we know he is a very great scholar. But uh, he was not joined in the uh, monastic debate. We thought he may not be very sharp in the, <laughs> in the debate. But for the first time, we saw when he was examined by the abbots, he was uh, brilliant and absolutely uh, um, sharp, equal with those who are uh, debating the monastery for a lifetime, and uh, the abbots find it quite difficult to uh, to debate with him. The next exam was at Sera Monastery. The whole of the Dalai Lama's government travelled with him. allowing him to consult with them about the growing tension in Lhasa. At the same time, he had to prepare for the next series of debates. But the abbots each had their own individual style of arguing. In ceremony, you see, when you debate with the opponent, good scholar, then their answer is something logical or something, you see, they, uh, valid, uh, meaningful. In Sarah Monastery, one about not that much scholar, not, not that top. So you see, they, from my side, you see, the preparation, if answer come this way, yes, this is the way to argue. If this way, uh, if answer has come this, uh, this kind of answer, then yes, already prepared. And his answer, unexpected answer. <laughs> so then my, my tutor noticed that, then he very kindly stopped, now finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's tremendous relief. <laughs> the last of the preliminary exams was some distance from Lhasa at Ganden Monastery. Ironically, the examinations at Ganden proved to be a brief period of respite for the Dalai Lama. Thousands more refugees had fled the fighting in the east and had arrived in Lhasa. A huge number were now camped around the outskirts of the city. Tensions with the occupying Chinese were high. They had been in Tibet for some nine years. There were food shortages in Lhasa, and rumours about massacres in eastern Tibet and the destruction of sacred sites. The Dalai Lama's final exam was arranged to take place at the same time as the Mullum New Year festival. There were 30,000 monks in the city and pilgrims were arriving from all over the country. The Jokhang temple was full to bursting. The cabinet, civil officials, and all of the senior abbots and monks were present. At the same time, the Chinese army had built gun emplacements on the rooftops. Soldiers carrying rifles were patrolling them. There are a lot of rumors about danger to uh, his security, and uh, the uh, threat perception was very high. And therefore, it was a very tight security arrangements are used to be there, and that, that was a bit annoying. And it, that was not, uh, uh, not a consonance with the monastic atmosphere. So a lot of um, uh, soldiers with uh, guns uh, and uh, very attentive and uh, uh, with walkie-talkies. These are not familiar with the people. So th that was a, a tense and also the joyful, these are going together.
One aspect, the whole atmosphere is so tense. Many people actually felt whether this big gathering can take place or not because of so much tense. But then everything go very smoothly. So everybody very happy. My final examination, successful. I think very successful. And also, uh, I myself, you know, from the corner of my mind, another thing is now uh, no more any lesson. <laughs> the Dalai Lama returned to the Norbalinka with his full retinue, but this time he was accompanied by armed guards. An invitation had arrived from the Chinese Governor General of Tibet, inviting the Dalai Lama to see a dance troupe at the Chinese military headquarters. In the name of dispensing with formality, the Chinese requested that he attended with unarmed bodyguards. Worried that a refusal would worsen the fragile situation, the Dalai Lama accepted, but the news soon spread. Thousands of people rushed to the Norbalinka and surrounded the palace, demanding that the Dalai Lama didn't go. Intelligence reports reached him saying that the Chinese were about to bomb the palace. Convinced that if he left, the people would be saved, the Dalai Lama decided he had to leave. Of course, I think top most in my mind is fear, sadness, and almost like the feeling of desperate. And also leaving some of my close friends, sweepers or some monks who, or who look after temples or the uh, libraries in Nulinga, and including my dog. So as a human level, very sad, one factor. Then also, uh, several thousand Tibetan, you see, suppose uh, different Nobilinga already gets it there. So that also additional worry. If something happened, then thousands of people will die. Then also, uh, my own life, there is danger. One person's sort of future, but the future of Tibet also is related. So therefore, anxiety, fear, little doubt, hesitation, and sadness, all mixed, very much mixed. The Dalai Lama escaped from the Norbalinka that night, disguised as a Tibetan soldier. The next day, reach uh, southern Tibet. Then fear of my life, then no longer. Then we have no hesitation to criticize <laughs> about our Chinese brothers and sisters. <laughs> While in Lhasa, uh, Although sometimes we criticize, but uh, from w one corner of our mind, uh, we, oh, oh, be careful, be careful, be careful, or oh, that kind of sort of situation. Then it, as soon as we reach uh, southern Tibet, the free from Chinese forces, we get some, oh, some, some extraordinary feeling now, free, freedom. Two weeks later, after an arduous journey through the Himalayas, the Dalai Lama reached safety in northern India. Within days, the Chinese systematically shelled the Norbalinka Palace, the Potala and the Jokang. The Tibetan resistance, made up of freedom fighters and monks who had taken up arms for the first time in their lives, were no match for the Chinese army. They surrendered after three days. The Tibetan government was abolished and the Chinese began to destroy Tibetan society and its Buddhist culture and traditions. Monasteries were looted and scriptures burnt. Nuns and monks were forced to denounce their faith, discard their robes. They were even forced to marry each other. 
class resentment amongst the peasants over Tibet's feudal system was ruthlessly exploited. The government officials and aristocrats were imprisoned or forced to do menial jobs. They were subjected to public interrogation sessions, many resulting in death. The Indian government granted the Dalai Lama political asylum and 80,000 refugees escaped from Tibet to join him. He has lived in Dharamsala, now known as Little Lhasa, ever since. The Dalai Lama appealed to the United Nations, calling on China to respect the human rights of Tibetans and their desire for self-determination. Despite three resolutions adopted by the UN General Assembly, the fact that thousands of monasteries were destroyed and hundreds of thousands of Tibetans were imprisoned in labor camps, the international community refused to intervene. Looking at these pictures that you have here in front of me, it's entirely a different world. And it was, to me, it's very sad. Uh, for instance, like my grandfather wanted to bet. I get very emotional to talk about Tibet, you know. Uh, my grandfather wanted Tibet to be with the outside world and to join the United Nations, to, to educate the Tibetans outside and to be more, with the modern world. But his visions and his um, wishes and also his 13th Dalai Lama and the 14th Dalai Lama had a wish that we must have contact with the international world. But Unfortunately, from our own side, we were so blind and we knew nothing of the outside world. We were just so engrossed in our little pond, you know, so we knew nothing. What was happening to the world, what, what could happen, and so we lost our country. The Dalai Lama advocates a middle way approach. He wants Tibetans to move back to Tibet, even though they have to be a minority within China. He remains determined that negotiations with the Chinese remain peaceful and positive. Middle of approach is the best. So present Chinese government policy regarding uh, different minorities, particularly regarding Tibet, is not healthy or not good for long run. So kind of op new opinions as a result of uh, better awareness now coming. So therefore, basically, I'm hopeful. Thank you. I'm 
Di dakwaan di sini. ไอ้เออดีเนี่ยดีดีมาดอดดีดอดดีเค้าดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอดดีดอด
ดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอกดีดอ
मैं उधर खरीद रहा हूँ मालूम तो था बता रहे हैं कोई किलो